Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Out of my heart, out of my heart, shine out of my heart, Lord Jesus. Shine out today, shine out always, shine out of my heart, Lord Jesus. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. We hope that you find this worship service meaningful and uplifting and that it draws you closer to God. As we're looking at this quarantine and virus situation, I read a post within the past couple of days that said for some people this is like a rainstorm, not that big a deal. For some people it's like a thunderstorm, a little more serious. And for others it's like a Category 5 hurricane. We never really know what someone else is going through, and we need to show grace and love and kindness as Christ did, because we're the body of Christ. And what a privilege we have to be that because of his grace, his love, and his mercy. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that today you are blessed. We pray that today you draw closer to God. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is you I stand in awe of you as we come into your holy presence and bow before your face we worship you in holy reverence surrounded by your endless grace we are saved because of your mercy. We are ransomed because of your love. You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand stand i stand in awe of you holy god to whom all praise is due i stand in awe of you and i stand i stand in awe of you i stand i stand in in all of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in all of you.
In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Will you join me in prayer? Dear God, we just want to come to you now to offer a word of thanks and just thank you for so much of the comfort that you've provided for so many people and that leading us spiritually, emotionally through this unknown circumstance. And we just pray that you continue to strengthen our faith through this and that some good comes out of it and ultimately that we get to go to church soon and be back together with one another and that those connections will be able to further be strengthened and get to enjoy our time together. And in all things, we give thanks to you and your, your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke 24, verses 44 through 49. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Well, it seems like we are closer to being able to gather together with one another. We're not there yet. Things are still canceled, but we're closer. I know that Phil is working desperately with a committee of folks to kind of begin planning how we're going to be making that transition. I have been blessed. I'm so very thankful for those of you who've taken time to, to watch our uh, assemblies and participate, who've done readings and prayers and communion messages. 
I, I've been incredibly thankful for Phil for taking leadership and pulling all this together. Uh, when we are able to get back together, I know it's going to be a wonderful celebration. I'm going to be doing a little bit of a dance. But uh, anyway, as we watch for that, this is the week that we're going to close out our study in Matthew. Uh, we've been at this for a bit longer than 18 months. I had planned along the line a couple of breaks, uh, do some topical studies, and uh, that meant that we even dropped out a whole set of lessons on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to return to that important set of text later on, but, but not for a while, okay? So after today, we're going to finish up with Matthew again, at least for a while. So for a final time, be returning and turning over your Bibles, your devices to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, as we read together. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, if there is anything that we have learned in this last six to seven weeks or so, it is how important being together, being connected is. I, I really miss you guys. I, I miss Donna. I miss Cindy. I'm even starting to miss John Keith. I miss, of course, the Hitchcocks and Jamie and Sarah Wright. I, I hate not seeing the other Marsha and the row of ladies with her, Pat and Carol and, of course, Jessica. I, I'm pained that I wasn't able to say a personal word of goodbye to Bill Clark. And I'm so looking forward to seeing Bill Bailey again. I know he's back in the hospital this weekend, but, but he's going to be out. He's a fighter. I'm looking forward to seeing him. And hey, I, I want to talk to Joan and Jeff about their news. Now, through the wonders of technologies, the Morgan Small Group, We've been able to meet every couple of weeks, so I've been able to keep up with what's happening with the Morgans and the Goose Trees and the Kellys and the Greens, okay? I, I was even able to kind of witness the completion of the Hinton's new garage area and then some of their flood, okay? But it wasn't like being there. And, and, and I miss you guys. I, I, I miss my kids, my grandkids. My grandson, Paxson, he's begun to pull up. He's almost walking. And Clara has started just to talk, talk, talk. She's pointing out her shapes, triangles and rectangles and squares. My granddaughter, Ella, the one that's the gymnast, she's been working out like two hours at a time. And she's doing almost 250 push-ups at a time. That's insane. My grandson, Lucas, he's becoming a teenager. And all I'm getting from any of those folks is pictures. Now look, that's better than nothing, but I want to be with them. And I am, by nature, an introvert, but this much social distance even from folks in the office has got to be a pain. Now, from a biblical perspective, if we go back into the book of Genesis, God made the observation that it was not good for man to be alone. And that wasn't just a male or female thing. It's more fundamental about our nature. Humans create bonds. We join together. We live in villages and towns and cities. We stick together in families and churches. Why, we even go to war in brigades and companies and platoons. We're educated in grades and classes. We work in teams and groups and corporations. Yeah, there are some hermits out there that live detached. But across individual societies and cultures and even eras, humans consistently seek inclusion over exclusion and membership over isolation 
and acceptance over rejection. I, I think all of us have been touched a bit by the reports of folks in hospice care, nursing homes, or in the ICU, and they're there alone without any family. Some of the most tear-invoking interviews that I've seen have been with family members who were kept away from loved ones as they face death. It's almost like we can't imagine facing the end of our life alone, by ourselves. My dad fell at the end of March, and he was taken to the hospital, and they determined that he had an infection, that he was dehydrated, but during that whole time, we couldn't go see him. Our only contact was to call the nurses, who were incredibly helpful, but to call the nurse station and get an update. He was then transferred back to the nursing home, and we had a family friend who worked there. But still, we only got limited reports on how things were going. Rachel and I went over one time, and we went by to see him. We had to stand outside the window and try to talk to him through the phone. It was so frustrating. This weekend, he's back in the hospital, and somewhere along the line, he's got a couple of broken bones in his back, so uh, they're this time just going to send him home. Now, on, on one level, that's going to be tough, but at least he won't be in some care center by himself where we can't see him, where we can't connect to him, we can't hold his hand. That, you see, is how we were created how God intended for us to live. Humans connect. We socialize. We interact. Now, Matthew's gospel is about God being with us. All the way back in Matthew chapter 1. That was the promise, right? Emmanuel. In Matthew 18, remember the promise where two or three are gathered there? I am with you, Jesus said. And here at the end of Matthew's Gospel, he says that he is with us. Now, we don't know the specifics of how. That's not explained. Of course, there's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know that this was a promise that was made initially to the eleven, maybe to those who were there around with him. But, but it is saying that he is with us. And by the way, the promise isn't that he will be with us like, you know, he's waiting in heaven for us. No, he's surely that. But surely he is with us. I am with you now, he said. Like many people, Rachel and I have been trying to kind of kill some time watching some extra television. We've been enjoying a couple of masterpiece series. I I've been picking up a couple of other things through Amazon Prime. In the latter, there's a rather unusual series that's called Tales from the Loop. Okay, It's kind of science fiction, but there's a lot of cool, neat character development. And that's something that we, we tend to really like. Okay, now to the point. There is a key figure who, spoiler alert, dies in episode four. But I'm not going to tell you who it is. Okay, But here's what really stuck to me. In the episode, this rational scientist tells another character in the show that he's going to die. And then he tells that character that there's no afterlife. Once you die, it's all over. Nothing. Nada. And he does so dispassionately, scientifically. But later in this episode, as he prepares to enter his home, he breaks down. He starts to sob and to weep and to wail. Why? Well, we don't know in the series, but I'm sure that it's connected to the fact that in his view, his life is ending. And that means all of the connections that he's held dear, it, it, all, those, all those relationships to his family, it's all going to be gone. And given his view of the future, he'll be completely alone. Look, TV shows aside, our lives do not have to end that way. We don't have to live that way. Since Christ's ascension to heaven, 
There have been those who have lived in the reality and the experience of God's presence. That presence and that knowledge of Christ as a person is the undeniable foundation of all of our knowledge and all of our living. This promise of the Lord's presence with His people, now we need to understand it is given in the context of a summons that we serve Him by taking the gospel to the world. The Lord isn't with us or among us simply given. That's not a promise for our pleasure and assurance. It isn't, as commentator uh, Bill France says, so much cozy reassurance as a necessary equipment for the mission. I don't mean to suggest that the Lord's presence is not a promise of immeasurable encouragement to the individual believer in every possible respect, including a whole range of pandemic. The Lord, yes, is with us when we're laid off. The Lord is with us if we get ill. The Lord is with us when our plans are dashed. God is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. In joy, and in woe, in life and in death, we practice and we experience the presence of Christ. It is the supreme privilege of our faith to know that He is with us and that He will love us and that He does care about us. But here that promise is made with a specific effect. It is given in a context of a mission upon which every Christian has been sent. The promise of the Lord's presence here at the close of Matthew is the means by which we will be enabled to fulfill our Savior's commission. And that is, in fact, what the promise of God's presence with His people is has often been. I think back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. God promised that He would be with Moses and that He would be with him. And that promise was given to Moses to assure him that he would be able to fulfill the calling that God had just given him to bring Israel out of bondage in Egypt. It was a seemingly impossible task, certainly impossible for a mere man, but the living God would be with Moses so that he could accomplish it. In a similar way, God commissions Joshua. He commissions Joshua, and he says, Moses' successor, that he's going to lead Israel into the promised land, and he's going to conquer the peoples who live there. And he gives a wonderful assurance to Joshua that he would be victorious wherever and whenever he went. He tells him, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, he adds. So it is here at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Consider the situation for a moment that these disciples faced. These guys are by and large Galileans. And it seems, yeah, there may have been some other folks that were gathered there when they met Jesus at this time in Galilee, but Galileans were generally regarded as second-class citizens by the Judean Jews and as little more than uneducated hillbillies by the Romans. These were very ordinary men. There wasn't really a politician or man with social statue among the group. And the Lord Jesus told them that they were to leave their homeland, leave their comfortable society of their familiar way of life, and go into a very forbidding and hostile world to preach a message that this amateur Jewish rabbi had died and had risen again. 
I mean, imagine going into the Greco-Roman world with a message like that. I mean, who's going to listen? Who's going to take these guys seriously? They surely imagined that they were just going to be laughed at and ignored. And they had those thoughts, and yet they actually left home and began the task of making disciples of all nations. And it was their confidence and their courage eventually that allowed them to see the utterly unexpected and an amazing success that came out of the fact that the Lord was with them. Christ, the Son of God, the maker of heaven and earth, the savior of the world, the king of kings, was there by their side. And that made the difference for them. It made the difference for their mission. And to be frank, there was perhaps no more unlikely thing that has ever happened in all the world than that this message about Jesus of Nazareth should be embraced by Gentiles as the truth about God and about man and about salvation. But listen, it was. It was embraced immediately and by enormous numbers of people, including many who were hearing about all of this and really any of this for the first time. They heard the message and they believed. They hardly knew why themselves? Their lives were turned upside down in a minute. They were required then to forsake their way of life, their Greco-Roman ethics and heritage, their personal and social loyalties. And they did. Why? Because Christ was with them. Christ was with them when they took the good news to the world. Anyone could have withstood them, but no one can withstand him. That is the story of the gospel's advance in the world. The presence of Christ being made known to folks who have no idea of it previously. And as in so many cases in history, it was the conviction of Christ's presence in the heart of a Christian that opened the heart of another to the reality of the Lord's presence. Now, brothers and sisters, as we conclude the Gospel of Matthew, we need to believe what our Savior has said. To take Him at His word, to trust that He will honor His promise, surely I am with you always, every hour, of every day to the end of the age. And that promise is made to you and it's made to me. It's made to you and me for the same purpose. It was made to the disciples in Galilee and that favored company who heard these words uttered by the very voice of Jesus himself. He is with us always, yes, in loss in hardship, in joy, in victory. We are accompanied through our days and our nights, through the viruses and the diseases, through job and food insecurity. But especially when we are engaged in the service of the Lord and His gospel, we are accompanied by His presence. He is before us. He is behind us. He is beside us. In the words of the psalmist, the angel of the Lord encounters around those who fear Him. And then, a little later in Psalm 16, I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Never, Jesus said, will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so we have the confidence as described by the writer in Hebrews chapter 13, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Is there a more amazing promise than this? That Christ is with us and that we carry His presence 
wherever we go. Look, in a strange way, we have, in essence, almost a power over Jesus. Because according to His promise, wherever we go, He must go as well. He is as really with us as He was with the disciples during the days of His ministry. But if that is true, and we believe that it is true, as we must, well, that is an incredible truth to live by. This is a promise meant to nerve and to steal and to inspire and, yes, to animate the mind and heart. It is a promise meant to set us to doing the Lord's work in the world. It is meant to make us disciple makers, whether among our own children or our friends, our neighbors, or, or, or those in other nations of the world. We will be undaunted by the difficulties of that work, even by the apparent hopelessness at first glance. And those who have done that work in the conviction of Christ's presence have found Him present indeed, always. And it has been the presence that made their ordinary and unremarkable words to, unbelievable, to unbelievers powerful and effective so that they transform the hearts and lives of others. It has been Christ's presence that has made even the most unlikely converts as sure of the truth of the gospel as, as they have ever been of anything in their existence. The Lord Jesus Christ can do that. And here, at the close of Matthew, He promises to do it through us. The Lord Christ can do that, and here He promises that that He will do. The Lord's promise should make all of us determined to be numbered among this honored, this privileged company who are world-making disciples for the Lord Christ. Please, in this next week, participate with Him. Join with Him in this thrilling opportunity that is before us. Make it a great week. Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, how I need you. To teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, 
Oh God, how I need you. Good morning, church. Uh, you know, as we watch all these videos lately, um, where we can't gather together physically, I think my favorite part is these little communion clips. And so um, it's our pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, and as we kind of look through the Gospels, we see it's pretty common practice that Jesus uh, would sit and eat a meal with his followers. And um, what made that time special wasn't the food that was on the table. It was the fact that, you know, they were all together. And for, um, you know, the disciples and apostles, it was that they were together in Christ. And so um, that's, that's the difference is that's what made it special that time together. Um, Jesus' followers continued these gatherings as a group of believers and commonly around the table. Uh, they set the standard for what the church should look like, which is laid out in Acts chapter 2. Um, so I'm going to read chapter 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And, you know, we can easily continue the practice of uh, gathering together, obviously not in the current times. Uh, but, you know, it, again, it's being with Christ and being in Christ together that makes us uh, where we can celebrate that time together. So let's bow. Father, thank you for today. Thank you so much for the gift of your son um, and the sacrifice that you made associated with that. And God, we thank you for this time that we can spend focusing on that gift and that unity that we have through Christ. Um, we thank you for his body and his blood. Um, and for the salvation and heaven that comes with that. God, we love you and thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hey, from hey. The hey. hey family. We're so thankful. We're thankful for our church family. Uh, even though we're separated, uh, all the ways we found to communicate with each other, and we're so thankful for that. And we are so thankful to have Kelsey and Ellen so near us, especially now that we have Rue. Okay. And we're so thankful for all you guys' love and support, especially during this time with a new baby, with Rue. Yes. Yeah, hi, Rue. Up of Rue. Hi. Yeah, hi, Rue. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the love yes, and everything, and we look forward to bringing him to church soon and seeing all you guys. Yes. I'm thankful that God gives me so much of what we need, um, and not only what we need, but what we don't even deserve. And I'm thankful for my friends and my family and um, for my home and uh, food and there's such a list of things um, that we can be thankful for, but I'm also thankful for his uh, grace and his mercy that he gives us every single day and every single morning um, and just the life that he's given us and that he carries us through this, um, this life and uh, continues to give us the strength and the wisdom that we need to get through. And um, I'm grateful for that. I was actually thinking when I was mowing the other day that um, just you know how great it is that um, even during this virus, it's come at a time where everything is blooming and it's just so beautiful outside and um, just all the new things that are um, coming to life. And um, I just think that's a reminder to us that, uh, that new things are to come and um, so much to be grateful and thankful for. Um, I'm thankful for each of you all and I love you dearly. I am thankful for 2020 technology. We've been able to come together on Sundays and worship as a church family. I've been able to see pictures of my friends. I've been able to uh, visit with my grandchildren and uh, 
even go to Bible classes and art classes via uh, Zoom technology. It's a great time to be alive. Riverwood for all the encouraging cards and all the time that you've spent thinking of others. We are so thankful for you and thankful to be a part of this church family. Hello Riverwood. I am thankful for each one of you and for the beautiful love that we share as a church family because of our Savior and because of the love of God. And I'm thankful for this bird that sings outside my window every single morning. God is so good, and we are so blessed. I'm thankful for a good night's sleep and a beautiful day. And I'm thankful for God's promises. I'm thankful for my family, our spiritual family, for technology. And it's a good thing there's just 20 seconds to do this or I could keep going on.